Yes, yeah, your boy Crypto Blood, and welcome to another kicking the session. Today I've got my man Hotep Jesus on. This guy is an author, tech startup founder, part of the Hotep movement. We're gonna get into that, understand what that is. Bitcoin advocate, and uh, as of recently, was on the Joe Rogan podcast. So this guy is doing it big in a major way, and I wanted to get him on to talk a variety of things. We're gonna talk about Trump, talk about the dangers of white liberalism, Bitcoin, as I stated, hacking Twitter, and a whole bunch more. So get that popcorn out, kick back, and relax. Hotep, what's going on, man? How are you? I'm great, brother. How are you? Good, man, good. So uh, I uh, I came across you. I haven't been following you for, for a long time. I have not. Um, I saw that you were on uh, my guy's Cryptologies podcast. And I was like, I saw that name. I didn't know you at that point. Then I saw you on uh, Joe Rogan's show. And then I was like, okay, I put those two together. You know how you just put stuff in the in your memory so you just remember? Then I saw you on yeah. Twitter, dude. <laughs> you were going crazy, man. Your Twitter is fire, bro. Very controversial. Uh, and, and, you know, and I think that's part of your whole thing. Uh, so yeah, maybe we can get into how controversial you are on Twitter and, and maybe that's part of your whole marketing ploy. Um, you got a book out. We'll talk about that, but tell me about Hotep. Now, when I heard Hotep, I don't know if you know who Dr. Ray Hagens is. You know who he is? Name sounds familiar. Drag my okay. okay. So he's a, he's a, um, ex pastor. He went over to Kemet or Egypt. Mm -hmm. found out you know all these secrets and all these things that they have been hiding from us right mm -hmm. that's the first time i heard hotep in his in his uh sermons i'll send you some some videos of his pretty dope that's a man. brother he's a brother yeah he's a pa okay. ex-pastor hey, now he's um hey, yeah so now he's him. uh you probably know him but anyway he uses hotep at the okay. at the end of his or at the beginning of his sermons or at the end he'll say hotep brothers or whatever whatever so when i heard hotep i'm like hotep I know that means like peace, like, you know what I'm saying? Like a yeah. gesture or a greeting. Tell us about that whole name, how that came about, uh, the whole Hotep Jesus movement. Yeah, so this was right around the time Mike Brown, Trayvon Martin, all of that stuff was happening. And uh, I started seeing like, you know, the scams that were occurring. Um, it was real, uh, real red flags we were seeing. And I spoke to Darren Seals over in, Ferguson, mm -hmm. uh, RIP to that brother. But, you know, he also put me privy. He was a primary source. He made me privy to some of the scam things that are happening with the Black Lives Matter movement and people mm -hmm. associated with such movements. Um, and uh, so I had been calling it out, you know, the PSYOP that was coming. I called out the fact that it was a pro LGBT movement disguised as a pro quote unquote black movement, you know, mm -hmm. we're talking colorful here. Mm -hmm. You know, um, so when I was, ex you know, exposing some of these things, the feminists, uh, some of the Black Lives Matter, some of the leaders, you know, prominent people, you know, verified people, people that Beyonce followed, <laughs> mm -hmm. were calling me a ho was calling me Hotep, making fun of the culture of Hotep. And I felt that it was quite disrespectful for them to take um, our history and uh, smear it like that and turn it into a pejorative. Mm -hmm. So I found it quite invective that they would do such. So what we decided to do was grab the term Hotep, exalt it, uh, bring it back to prominence. The founder of medicine is M. Hotep, mm. you know? So, you know, if we, if we gonna, if we're gonna go out here and start using words. Let's, let's know what we're, what we're, what we're abusing or using. So my, my followers probably don't, know the hotep movement um yeah. kind of bring them up to speed on what that movement is um it is it a black supremacist movement or is it not kind of kind of give me your spiel uh, on that uh you know when we start talking about supremacy and supremacists these these things mean different things to different people right you know? um you listen to Karis one when he talks about, you know, white supremacy. He says, there's no such thing as white supremacy. He says, to be supreme is to be great. He's mm -hmm. like, the people that are uh, 
complicit in white supremacy are a bunch of thugs and thieves. They're not supreme. They're, that's no that's no supremacy. He said supremacy would be a white ally. Mm. You know, um, so you know what do people mean by black supremacists? Because sometimes when you think supremacy, you think hate, and I don't think Oteps hate anybody. You know, mm -hmm. I do believe that they think highly. We think highly of ourselves. You know, we we um, we think we're capable of anything any other human can do and more. Right. You know, um, we know our history. We know we know who we are. We know our contributions to civilization um, and however people want to feel about these facts is on them. I think a lot of times when people call you a black supremacist. It's their uh, insecurity speaking. Mm -hmm. You know, a lot of people are insecure to deal with the fact that uh, Europe was not civilized. And at the same time that Africa was, you know. Uh, right. So with all the whole like the whole Moors, Moorish movement and all of that, you're talking kind of re referring to that. Before that, before that, <laughs> you know, we can go back to uh, ancient Rome. Uh, yeah, ancient Rome. Mm -hmm. Rome, Rome was, you know, like I said on Rogan, Rogan was getting fed by ancient so-called Egypt, ancient Kemet. Their grain came from Egypt. It came from Kemet. So we, who's we all? Do you do you have like an official group like the Hotep movement? Is it a, is it an official group or is it just? people who kind of adapt that ideology and, yeah. and kind of put that uh, that moniker on on their name yeah you know we have uh official group you know we have the show that's been told you uncle hotel do mm -hmm. dudes is our uh president um i'm you know a, uh, in in, in uh, in-house strategist market marketer um mike writer uh phoenix supporter we you know lauren you know we we have a team an mm -hmm. in-house team um that helps us accomplish things. Uh, what we're about is is more or less focusing on economics and finance. Right. I find that that's the Achilles' heels for most Americans, you know, let alone Black people. You know, um, I was uh, speaking to uh, a professional banker, somebody who works uh, with Wall Street and on Wall Street in these banks, and having conversations with them, and uh, she couldn't keep up with me. <laughs> mm. you know so a lot of that has to do with the fact that they definitely want these institutionalized financial brokers to uh, only sell certain products and therefore to convince people to sell any certain products you have to uh, cajole the philosophy if, mm -hmm. you, if you will so, right so uh, those individuals don't even really know how detrimental the the society the not the society, but the institution they're working for is to society. Yeah, ask a right? financial advisor. Ask a financial advisor. You know, whether it be Morgan Stanley or something else. Say, how do you feel about Bitcoin? Right? They're like, oh no, Bitcoin's no god. Right? And this is right. the argument I had with this banker was over Bitcoin. I said, I said, she said, uh, you know, uh, Bitcoin's value is based upon emotions. And I said, okay, you're not wrong. I said, but you work in in. Uh, Wall Street, right? I said, what is what is the uh, stock uh, value based upon? We argued for a little bit and we came to the conclusion. It's also based upon emotion. Everything Absolutely. Cool. Absolutely. And, I, you know, I was I was watching this one Asian guy, man. He breaks it down really nicely about stocks, man. And how if it's not paying a dividend is really just like you said, the, the, the value is conjured up out of out of supply and demand. And, and that's market forces that basically people are trading right those are human beings for even if it's an algo yeah. those are still human beings that created the algo yeah and and it's all based off of emotions right people that pe when people say something is based upon emotions they make it seem like that is artificial but that's not exactly. artificial that's extremely natural yeah yeah, <laughs> yeah value emotions. value is value <laughs> is we put we put value on things it's derived yeah. from us putting a value on it yeah you know there's a reason why you can charge such and such for gucci and yep. why you have to charge less for haynes it's called right. perception value yeah. is based upon perception we you know we can't remove that from the market the moment you remove that from the market you're dealing with communism <laughs> right right <laughs> facts, know, facts. Gotta start controlling the market based upon logic of what you think should happen what you think should occur instead of letting the market just naturally uh rise or fall and, and correct yourself 
you know so, but, so tell me tell me a little bit about your upbringing man um you know your 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 mother your father um yeah you you were brought up as a christian am i correct i was blessed i was blessed you know when i came into this world i don't know what i did right in the last life but man i got blessed with a wonderful mother and a wonderful father who are still together we nice. celebrated their uh 40th anniversary this year wow yeah you know we're talking about the strong uh melanated african couple <laughs> you know mm -hmm. um my father's from jamaica my mother is a native to the american lands indigenous person so you know um because of my mother's education she went she got her master's degree my father was an electrical engineer um I lived an affluent lifestyle. You know, I lived mm -hmm. on the white side of town. Mm -hmm. um, I didn't live on the black side of town. Um, so I, I grew up, you know, I would say at least semi-affluent, you know, not super affluent. But if my parents wanted to, they could have afforded a Porsche. My mother's an accountant, so we drove Honda Accords and Acuras, mm -hmm. you know? Hey, um, Acuras wasn't bad back then, though. Yeah, Acuras <laughs> was just, that was just That was a joint, then. right? Yeah, you know? <laughs> But my mom was real was real good with money. So, you know, I learned how to, you know, manage finances through my mother. She did taxes, of course, blah, 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 blah. And my father was a military man. So I was raised by a military father who, you know, taught me about war, rules of engagement, so on and so forth. You know, and just being a man generally, you know, we're dealing with somebody who uh, was an electrical engineer. So, you know, we would, you, he could build a house from the ground up, you know. So I, I know a lot of, a lot of that, uh, knowledge that he has he's passed some of that down to me um you know he grew he grew me up hard you know mm -hmm. um i come down a lot on people on sports and like you walk around with your favorite sports team in your bio i think it needs to be your company what company do you own or, or what you know shares do you own in the company if you start putting right. stuff in your bio you start you know free advertising for people <laughs> you know but i was an athlete in high school you know and after high school you know i was a multi-sport athlete you know i played soccer and basketball you know so, so how so, so you being coming from, you know, growing up in an affluent, a more affluent uh, culture or society, I'm assuming where you went to school was probably predominantly white. Predominantly white. Yeah. So how did that um, help you? Own. How did that hinder you? Because I had a, kind of the same scenario. Like I grew up in the hood, but my mom saw the value in basically opening my network to the other side so she had me i was going to real affluent middle schools every day going from the hood all the way out to the burbs and then back and i was able to see both sides of the fence man and it gave me a better i think more well-rounded view of of life and society so absolutely yeah it's very similar with me where um, in the summer months, I would go to my grandma's house and my grandma lived in the hood and all my cousins was from the hood. You know, mm -hmm. I got a humongous family, you know, hundreds of cousins right here just here in New Jersey. And they be gang banging and everything, you know what I'm mm -hmm. saying? So I, I, again, I was one of those well-rounded kids, but it was rough because what would happen is I'd be in, with the white folks in the mm -hmm. school months, then i go to the hood. Mm -hmm. Now you got to readjust to the hood because you're right, in the right. suburbs. <laughs> right, 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 right. You so, got to throw that little accent, the little Caucasian, you know, yeah, what they yeah. call call white proper. But that, well, you know yeah. what I mean. Talking yeah, proper, it doesn't mean you're, you're white or black, but you right. know what I mean. That's, that's what you, you know, your cousins be like, ah, you talk white. You yeah. Talk white, right? <laughs> so then you adjust to the hood all summer. Now it's time to go back to the burbs. Now you super thugged out. Right. <laughs> so now that everybody like, yo, why is you bugging? Why is you wilding? And it's just like, nigga, y'all soft we from the hood, <laughs> right. you know. So then you 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 got to do a whole year here, whole year of school. Then it's like, all right, back to the hood. Now you got to readjust all over. <laughs> right, right. So, but it, but like you said, it made you well rounded because you saw both worlds and and you you know you have like I have the ability to code switch. I yes. can go and I can change my accent and sound. Yes. You know and dictate each and every syllable of words right and right. enunciate and pronounce i know how to do that but i also know how to just relax my speech and and, and be able to relate to people that look like and i, I don't think some people call that being fake i think that's just being uh well-rounded and, and, and being able to adapt to your environment because 
what I've noticed is that people are more receptive to you if they feel comfortable with you, right? Yeah. So if you have a certain, you talk a certain way or you look a certain way, perception is reality, unfortunately. If I'm walking yeah. around with a hoodie on, I got my baseball cap on, and I'm in the burbs somewhere, they're going to, they, and they do, I get yeah. microaggression all the time because I'm, yeah. you know, I'm dressed a certain way and that's just how society is, right? They, they judge first, right. then, uh, you know, possibly look to, to, you know, learn who you are as a person. Yeah. Yeah. It's, you know, it's always going to be that judgment. Um, I, 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 at this point in my life, I've figured out how to blend the two accents into one. Mm -hmm. um, because what I find is sometimes you'll be in a, you know, a, a conference room with a bunch of yuppies, white yuppies, or I should say European yuppies, and uh, they're very judgmental, right? So I'll make a, I'll, I'll have my accent completely white. And as soon as they say something I don't like, I'll code switch straight to black. Be like, what? <laughs> 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 and so that usually catches them off guard. You know, or sometimes when I'm excited or, or you know, I'm, I'm really into something, you know, I'll use a, a, a hood phrase or something like that, or my accent to be a little bit more ethnic, yeah. you know, or I'll go through a whole entire interview ethnic. But what they'll find is there are certain moments and things you say where they see intelligence. And when, yep. they, when they, usually when people talk to me, they're like, oh, this guy's not no dummy. So they don't really, yeah. they kind of forget how you speak. And now they're more focused on, all right, this guy kind of gets it. You know? So how are you with, do you, you have kids, correct? Yeah. Yeah. Okay. So how do you plan? Cause I think about this and I talk to my wife about this all the time. Like, you know, it, it, when you have your first kid, man, that just changes your whole perspective on, on life. And yeah. you start to try to forecast and look out. Right. Yeah. And, and say, play more, you know, chess than checkers. Right. Um, in your moves as a, as a man. So, how do you, how do you, how are you going to um, play that with your kids and helping them see both sides, right? So that they're not too much of the suburban culture and out of touch with, you know, the inner city. Yeah. And and, and how, how are you planning on balancing that? And how are you doing that now? Uh, I don't plan on balancing it. Um, okay. I think that just them being around me. I spent a lot of time with my kids, a lot of time with my kids. Them being around me, um, you know, I got, you know, my homies, they, they come around my homies sometimes. So I take them to the studio with cats that's in there recording. You know, I let them get, it's, for me, it's more, you know, I got two, I got two boys. So for okay. me, it's more about uh, letting them absorb masculinity, mm -hmm. you, know, um, you know, more specific melanated masculinity um, than, any, than anything else, um, letting them see, you know, strong black brothers work together if we talk colorful, you know? Um, but other than that, my, my, for my kids, it's, it's more about building that superiority. So um, I'm their coach. I train them in athletics. And uh, I think athletics is a great way to uh, groom kids. It's a great way to teach them discipline, mm -hmm. you know? Um, and teamwork and all of that and leadership. So I work with them on that. And then it's also just about, you know, being intellectual. Um, you know, my kids get straight A's, mm -hmm. <laughs> you know, mm -hmm. and my son, I got a son that is exactly like me. And um, in high school, I flunked out of, you know, every class, you know, but I was smart too, because for example, when I had social studies, I remember we got it on the social studies final, I got an A and there was only two kids in the class that got an A, it was me and my homie, <laughs> mm -hmm. you know, that I studied with, you know, because, uh, you know, he, he needed my help. So I studied right. with him, you know. Right. Um, but I got to see in the class. And the teacher said to me, he's like, yo, why don't you, um, he said, why don't, why don't you just do your homework? You would have got an A in this class. I said, homework is stupid. Why don't you stop giving me homework? If you know I know the material, obviously I don't need homework, right? So he just kind of like laughed and shrugged it off. So I went through all of high school like that, you know. But I got a son who's exactly like me. And in the early stages of going to school, he was going down that path I was going down where, you know, with turning in assignments and homework, this, that, and the third. And I've been able to reverse that, mm. you know, whereas my parents couldn't reverse it. You know, our parents' generation is more like spankings and punishment and all this type of stuff. 
Whereas yeah, I don't spank. I don't spank. I don't spank my kid. I don't spank right. my kid. Uh, my wife does. We I, we have a daughter, so I wouldn't spank a a, a girl anyway. But my right. my wife doesn't spank. Uh, what it, it just seems like, man. I don't know how old you are. It seems like maybe in your thirties. I'm in my thirties. It's it's been a culture shift for us in the black community. I think in many cases. I don't know. Maybe I'm being biased because of the people it's, that I'm around. But we're yeah. not looking to. I used to get my ass whooped, bro. Me too. Yeah. You know you what I'm saying? It. But it but doesn't. You gotta remember, that's not just the black thing. That was an Italian thing too. My homie, I used to go over to his house, and his father had a cricket bat, and he was Italian. And I remember Indians being hanging too. with him yeah. one day. His dad told him to do something. He didn't do it. His dad didn't even ask the second time. He just grabbed the paddle. And I remember Michael. He hopped right up and he started hauling the ass. His dad said, "What?" Hit him right on the ass with that cricket paddle. You know, mm. so it's not really, I don't think it's, it was a culture thing. I think it's a, it's, it's a thing of the times, the times you're in. Because when my father was talking about how his stepdad brought him up, I'm like, damn, I thought you brought me up rough. Like, his stepdad tried to drown him. <laughs> you know what I mean? like, stepdad waterboarding him, huh? Yeah, like, it was, it's a little bit, you know, those, those times was different. So, um, you know, we got to we gotta uh, remember it's, it's a lot of that. You know, and also you got to remember, we got the internet now, so we're a little bit more intelligent than our parents' generation. And this yeah. generation is going to be more intelligent than us just because of, you know, how fast the, we the can knowledge you're able to ascertain. Right. Yeah. Right. So with my kids, you know, I practice, well, first of all, I practice emotional intelligence on my own, period. And then I teach it to them, um, you know. So if they see dad has emotional intelligence, it just rubs off. You know, when you start having to snap and yell at your kids, you're teaching them to have a short fuse, you know. Right. And sometimes. to express their uh, to communicate in that manner when you use words. Right. Right. Use words. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. Exactly. So exactly. I've been able to sit down and just have conversations mm -hmm. with my sons and get through to them just by telling them about you know, just the world you know yep and, and how people will view them based upon you know certain things and then being honest and say your daddy sucked at school i come on be like man i love y'all man y'all great because daddy was terrible at school. I'm so proud of you you know so i'm just really honest with the kids what you do know? you think about college man this is another subject uh that i think our generation the millennials really see that we were sold a, ba a bill of horrible goods you know uh we were bamboozled hoodwinked all yeah, that good stuff yeah, what, what I, are your was, thoughts about college yeah i was smart you know i dropped out <laughs> i i saw the jig early um yeah. i saw it twice i saw it in, a, in my accounting class when my teacher pulled up in like this pinto and i said to myself damn, I got a nicer car to my teacher. I'm out earning my teacher. At 19, I was making, you know, close to $75,000 a year. Mm -hmm. So I was like, I'm out earning my teacher. Something doesn't sit right with me. And then um, my second one was uh, we moved and I went to a different community college. And this time I was like, I'm going to take school serious. And then I walked into school uh, late one day and the teacher said something. And I said to him, I said, you know, um, I paid for a service. And, and to be taught. And usually when you pay for a service, you're the one that dictates the, the terms. And here you are treating the customer like the fool. And I said, mm. I'll let you know when I'm late. I'll let you know when you're late. And he just shut the fuck up. You know what I mean? <laughs> yeah, so, I think uh, I think a lot of that has to do with the internet, man. Like I dropped out of college as well. I was mm -hmm. making, I, I started my, my web development company at, 20 and was uh, while i was going to school was building that company up and uh, yeah. i just got to the point where i literally was learning more outside of school than mm -hmm. the teachers were teaching me in school because they were so behind yeah. you know I, I grew up as a whiz kid you know programming and stuff at a young age so i always knew to go to the internet to get information you know what i'm saying right and so i yeah. think is, is that what is that what you think the catalyst is as far as college the value yeah. proposition for college being less and less nowadays the internet well college college is uh college is is where you go to build your billion dollar business right 
it's not where you go to get a degree to get a job. I think if you're going to do that, you're stupid. Outside of the major sciences, right? And the hard sciences and law, you know, that's different. But if you're going in there for like business, it's just like, all right, put it like this. When you go to a college, every every department that a business needs, it's about seven departments that a business needs at the very general level, five to seven departments. Everything exists on your university. If you can't form your team and get your 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 thing off the ground while you're still living off your parents and you have your consumer right there, like you literally live in a dorm with consumers right there. It's like living in a project building with your consumer right there. Of course, you're going to sell drugs to everybody in your building, right? Mm -hmm. So if you, college kids do it, they sell marijuana and, and e-pills and stuff in the people in the college building. So it's like, if you're right. selling drugs, that means there's consumers right there that you're sleeping with. So that's when you want to sell your app or your shirt. So this, that's the time to get your brand off. You know, if you go into school not trying to get your brand off, then it's kind of like, uh, I don't know if it makes sense to go. You gotcha, know, I gotcha. think unless I think, you're right, a doctor, or you're trying to be a doctor or a lawyer, yeah. you're going to have to go. But many of the other, you know, professions, man, I just I warn these kids to really take a take a year or two off, man, from high school. That's what they do in other countries. It's just yeah. that we're in this capitalistic or I should say crony capitalism society here in America where they're just trying to run you right through, build up all that debt, you know, yeah. keep you in that debt slave uh, wheelhouse. Yeah, so I got to um I got to I got to pivot off of what you just said. You mentioned the term crony capitalism and my following will crucify me if I don't allow if I don't say this. So in, in my following we don't we don't we don't use that term crony capitalism. Mm -hmm. uh, what we call it is exploitation of socialist systems. Um because we found that even the term capitalism is a socialist created term. Um which Break that down. That, what what is that? What do you mean? I've never heard this before. Yeah. So capitalism. Well, capital, I believe, is Latin, right? Mm -hmm. And then, um, so that word had existed, which is you know, kind of like means something store of value, almost, right? You can look it up, fact check me, whatever. Basically, uh, a good capital good, right? So later we get this thing that turns capital into capitalism like as is, if it's a system but when you look at the people that make this term popular it's marxism and, and Karl marx is the one that popularizes this term capitalism and turns it into a pejorative to mean something negative um when really um uh, capitalism is nature so we don't use the term capitalism what we call it is uh uh, economic naturalism because uh, what we call capitalism is really just uh, a freedom of exchange of goods without interference right so you have socialism and then you have freedom it's not socialism and capitalism you have socialism and freedom what socialism does is it comes and puts restrictions on everything and tries to control everything and centralize things that's why uh, we like Bitcoin because it's decentralization, while it's socialism is centralization. It's the complete opposite. You can go look up what Sen Le Lenin said. He said 90% of getting a communist nation is having a central bank, you know? So, so is it, but is it black and white though, man? Like, meaning, I, I think there's a gradient when it comes to any of these. If I know, I know we're talking, I know you have your term for capitalism, but you know, we're talking about the same thing, right? Can we have something like capitalism go too far to the right or well, to we've the never left. Seen, we've never seen capitalism. Okay. We've never seen capitalism. We have to understand that when the United States was founded in 1776, I believe in 1786, uh, we had uh, a script re uh, issued from, from England or Great Britain. They said, mm -hmm. look, you guys aren't allowed to have your own money anymore. And that was the reason we had the Revolutionary War. For the Revolutionary War, to tell you about the Boston Tea Party and the tax. Yeah. The tax was 1%. Nobody's complaining about a 1% tax. I love no. a 1% I'll take tax, that right, right now. Right. What, what people were complaining about was the fact that the colonists figured out that their market kept crashing because Great Britain was controlling the currency. 
Mm-hmm. So then we had uh, what was the name of that act? There was a new, there was an act passed that got rid of that currency, and this came, you know, after the Revolutionary War. So when we talk about capitalism, show me a time when capitalism hasn't been choked out because. Before cap, what, 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 they, what we think we're in now is capitalism. In the United States, all ten prongs of cap of of, of communism have already been implemented, impl- uh, implement, uh, imp- implemented in the United States. Yeah, I you agree. Know? So, so where's this capitalism? Before capitalism, you got socialism, right, all through mm-hmm. the world. And before that, what you had, you had feudalism. Feudalism. Mm-hmm. You see what I'm saying? So, show me a time where we had capitalism. We did. We went from feudalism. To push in socialism, the United States was founded, which was supposed to be founded on this thing, or this so-called thing called capitalism. But really, it's that it, it, there was no term in America. It was called freedom. America was founded on freedom. That's why I said there's no such thing as called capitalism. It's called freedom. Right. So, so but we don't have that though. No, what we had was the oppressive nature of the five ruling uh, banks of Europe. Yeah. Who kept coming down on us and installing these central banks. When you look mm-hmm. at the Civil War, what we had, we had the first national bank, right? Mm-hmm. Then they had a second national bank. They kept trying to put this central bank in, central bank. So then we had a civil war. A lot of people don't know the civil war was fought over the central bank. <laughs> it was yep. created by the central banks. They wanted to bankrupt the North and the South to force them into debt. And the South was in debt. So after the Civil War, the North said to the South, said, look, Y'all can come back, but y'all can't bring y'all debt. Talk to them banks and let them know that we're not paying that debt back. Just because they fooled us and brought us into war and you borrowed this money to go buy guns, that ain't got nothing to do with the formation of this new entity we're about to create, this new co- corporation we're about to create. And they said, cool, that debt is absolved. Mm-hmm. Then the central bank is what they had to do. They, they pulled another war, World War One, <laughs> Right. World War Two. Now we in the debt to the banks again. Then what happened? We got the Federal Reserve back. That was 1913. That was like, uh, no, that's World War I. Then yeah, World War that's II when the taxes later. started. That's when the you know? IRS comes. You see yep. what I'm saying? So show me a time when ch- capitalism or so-called capitalism, freedom, wasn't choked out. So let me ask you this then. Is it possible? Is it a pipe dream? Is, yep. is, it, is it pie in the sky to believe that we will have a true capitalistic or free um society when it comes to commerce i, I don't see it yeah, happening man it'll happen Where? We, i mean we won't see it but okay. it's gonna happen okay. you know as there's only so long you can choke an organism before it frees itself mm-hmm. we saw that with with slavery you know it's only right. so long before people are gonna revolt um you know 100 years 200 years it's gonna be a revolution in this country probably when the robots take over right and everybody's just like yo what the fuck like there's no jobs right and yeah ubi is on full f- yeah <laughs> yeah you know what i mean because because honestly the robots shouldn't be taking jobs they should be creating jobs right because it's going to increase industry the problem is it's not the the robots it's the lack of education and lack of ambition and the la- lack of inspiration it's what's going to steal jobs it's not the it's not the robots you got to remember when the internet was born when the computers were born they said a lot of people lost business lost jobs but new jobs were created it was up to you to go and learn new skills for those jobs <laughs> you know what I mean? right so, so the issue is that you know when technology many times creates what's called structural unemployment because you have these people that can't adapt right. fast enough, right? If if I've been programming all my life, or you got a Mike, a, a Mark Zuckerberg, or whatever, he's been programming all his life. Uncle Henry can't, who worked at Henry Ford or you know whatever GM, he yes. ain't gonna be able to get up and start coding tomorrow, you know. So yeah, that's part one of the kicking session with Hotep Jesus. Hope you guys enjoyed it. Make sure you like, share, and subscribe. And look out for part two coming soon, tomorrow, actually. Until then, stay real, stay true, and most importantly, be you. I'm out of here, people. Holla.